Well, welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks, Chris. Well, now, now, Tom, I think uh, most adult Canadians have some awareness of the, uh, of the grotesque and depraved deeds perpetrated historically against the First Peoples of the continent, but I'm certain very few have an appreciation of just how grotesque and depraved that behavior was. Now, your book, The True Story of Canada's War of Extermination on the Pacific, relates a, a ruthlessly uh, calculated and methodically uh, planned and executed plot that is uh, an expression of evil rarely matched. Now, now Tom, where, where does our story begin? Well, Chris, I think a really useful way of, uh, of, of starting is to go back to the beginning and always start with the foundation. And uh, it's useful to uh, keep in mind how we tell the story very differently. Uh, in the uh, universities and in the school books, what we say is that uh, British Columbia's political transformation was very orderly and there's little resistance by the indigenous nations. We see the land was mostly empty, so it doesn't matter if the uh, governments uh, don't make treaties. And we say that the natives acquiesced in the uh, transfer of power. And we say that while it's true they did die from disease, that this was from natural causes, uh, and that this is their own fault uh, for the most part uh, because of the cultural weaknesses and because of their, uh, their own uh, biological order. And on this, uh, on this view, which is the dominant view, uh, in, in British Columbia, uh, Canada inherited a uh, legacy of respect and cooperation. But if you go out into uh, native communities, as I have for the last 10 years, and you uh, sit in the back of uh, community meetings and you listen to elders and you listen to community leaders and so on, they teach a very different history of British Columbia. And it's one that they uh, don't even tell us uh, that, that's there when you go to universities. Now, what the native uh, elders and what the native leaders and uh, what they will tell you in the back of these uh, meetings is that uh, during the regime change period between the time when the indigenous nations were sovereign in what's now British Columbia and when Canada became sovereign, that the uh, settlers deliberately spread smallpox as the primary means for the de facto imposition of British institutions. And when I say de facto in, uh, imposition, that's uh, how they actually came about on the ground. It's one thing to make laws, it's quite another thing to implement them on the ground. And so the uh, smallpox was used uh, in this transition. And so smallpox is also used to uh, dispossess them of, of uh, land and resources. And it's used to depopulate the uh, area so that it can be repopulated with European settlers. Now, these uh, two narratives uh, can't be reconciled. I mean, they're so different, it's impossible to reconcile them. Sometimes we say in history, well, a little of this and a little of that. It's not possible in this case. Uh, in this case, either they killed them or they didn't. I mean, this is, a, this is an either or uh, sort of thing. Now, the alleged uh, smallpox genocide took place in 1862 and 1863. And uh, the native death toll there is about 100,000 from what I can tell from uh, eyewitness accounts and so on. Now, the spectacular thing is that these 100,000 people all died in about nine or 10 months. Now, if if today 100,000 people died and counted in 9 or 10 months, we'd know about I mean, that would be part of the history forever. Yeah, just look at the bird flu. I mean, I don't know how many deaths in Canada there were from the bird flu, but it was, it was an absolute media mad, uh, madness on that. Exactly. Now, now there's some, uh, some Native nations like the Chilcotin um, and the uh, Statimic and others, Haida, where the death toll is 75% of the entire nation, the entire population. I mean, and, and I think about this sometimes. If you come to Victoria and imagine that if, you know 50,000 people die, <clears throat> or 500,000 people, depending on what the population is, I mean, it would be spectacular. We, I mean, they, uh, for the survivors, we would just uh, wouldn't know how to cope. So this uh, seems to me that this event that took place in 1862 is, uh, I sometimes call it, it's the greatest human tragedy that ever took place on Canadian soil. <laughs> There's no nothing else that compares to it that uh, was any is anything anywhere near close in terms of the death toll. Well, well, now Tom, there is a there's, there's a point of contention now. Okay, the um, uh, the smallpox epidemic it took place. I mean, it happened. So we it, that is not uh, that's incontrovertible. Um, but. Um, was it was it done on purpose or was it just an accident? I mean, in the reports of the time, uh, uh, the officials and especially the doctor Helmuken, of course, who, whose uh, street hosts the General Hospital now, he said, "Well, we offered we offered to uh, uh, vaccines to the natives and they refused." It, I mean, is that true? 
Well, there's two, uh, there's two kind of threads here. Uh, one is the question of who spread the disease, and the other is the question of how they did it. Um, with respect to how they did it, there's uh, three main methods that were used. One of them was uh, phony vaccination programs. Uh, and Dr. Helmkin himself uh, participated in a phony vaccination program after they uh, vaccinated the uh, natives here in Victoria. He claimed to have vaccinated 500. The disease then broke out. Uh, and that's not what you normally expect of a vaccination program. What you expect is that the disease stops. And this uh, same effect happened uh, in several other locations throughout the province where there would be a doctor who would conduct a vaccination program. And then after he left, the disease would break out and it would break out in a great force. And that's true. Uh, well, that happened actually at Victoria, but it also happened uh, in the Stikin uh, Gold Rush. And it happened at uh, Lytton as well. So this uh, issue of, uh, of them offering vaccine is, uh, yes, you can be offered vaccine, but doesn't mean you got vaccine. Up the coast, uh, the Awikinos, at the time, they said the vaccine they sold us started the disease. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happened. Well, now, that you, you're, in your research, you've even traced like a, a patient zero, a, a typhoid Mary figure. But rather than being a, a hapless victim himself, he was an active agent in the spread of this disease? Well, they, uh, you have to understand the difference uh, between uh, vaccination and inoculation is kind of the, kind of the key element that's uh, behind this. And uh, the difference is this. When you vaccinate somebody, uh, you give them a cowpox and they develop a immunity to smallpox. But if you inoculate them, you give them smallpox, and while they develop an immunity and they're safe themselves, they can then pass on the disease to others. Uh, and that seems to be uh, what happened with the original people who came to Victoria with the disease and brought it here and with uh, what happened in other locations around the province, that these uh, people are deliberately inoculated with smallpox. They're not at risk themselves because that's a common means of uh, preventing uh, getting the disease is to give you a mild case and you get a mild case, but you're then infectious. And this uh, procedure, this inoculation procedure was illegal. It had been made uh, illegal in 1840 in England and illegal in 1855 in Canada. Earlier than that, it was illegal all through Europe for exactly this reason. Too that dangerous. It, it was too dangerous and it would start epidemics and they would have what would be called inoculation epidemics. And most uh, natives up the coast, for example, they died in inoculation epidemics. So the idea is you, you get, if you're going to use this method, you get the inoculation and then you're separated from, from other people until, what, like a week or two weeks or something until you're not infection, an, a risk of infection anymore, right? The way, the way to do it safely is uh, the way they did it in Europe safely. They had uh, two, two methods of doing it safely. One was for the rich and one was for the poor. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wonder which one worked. <laughs> the, uh, if, if the rich were being inoculated, what would happen is you'd go to a smallpox spa, uh, you'd be there for 40 days, you'd get massages and uh, you'd be isolated uh, amongst people who couldn't get the disease. For the poor people, what they tried to do is they tried to inoculate everybody in the village. But if they don't get everybody in the village, the people that they don't get uh, are, are then will be susceptible to getting the disease when everybody that's inoculated and start becoming infectious. And it takes about 10 days uh, after you're inoculated or after you get the disease until you become infectious. Well, now, so what happened? Well, when they uh, when they do these inoculation epidemics, uh, what will happen is, uh, they, and they do them in two ways. Uh, one one of the ways is to send uh, people who've been inoculated to visit villages and to circulate in the villages. Uh, that's one method that was used. Uh, and this is infected people going and, <laughs> and mingling amongst un, uh, unvaccinated people. Uh, actually, what they do is they systematically go and they visit each house in the village. Uh, there's a native elder at uh, Lytton who described exactly this process. He said they uh, got this guy with uh, sick with smallpox, and he went around and he, and he killed them all just by visiting somebody at each house. Um, and that's that's the idea of this uh, practice. And this practice produces an extremely high kill rate. The other way to, to do it with uh, is what I call selective inoculation programs. And that's uh, you go to a village and you say, well, I'm here, I'm going to help you out. And then you uh, inoculate uh, 10 people or 15 people out of a village of 200. Those people then in uh, 10 days, they come down with smallpox and they spread it to the remaining uh, 200 people. So there's two methods uh, how they used it. Well, now, and these people, they know. They know what they're doing. They know full well. I mean, this is, you know, they know that they're sick. They know that they're going to make others sick. And yet they systematically go through these villages and, and ensure, uh, as you put it, a high kill rate. Yes. 
in the, some of these cases, the uh, and which I document in the book, the land underneath the villages has been uh, uh, preempted by speculators. Uh, the most spectacular, the most spectacular cases at Bellacula, where this new Aberdeen Land Syndicate had uh, 960 acres uh, staked underneath the villages at Bellacula, and they uh, brought these people in on the pool expedition, uh, and they killed them all in about uh, 20 days. Well, preemptive uh, attacks are nothing uh, strange to us uh, in the 21st century, but that is an actual term for a legal um, procedure that was kept in, in what you call the uh, the, uh, the what are they, the 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 Fort Clique uh, group of uh, men. Uh, these are our, our city fathers. Uh, apologies to feminism, uh, Mr. Douglas and Helmican and uh, Kerry, the uh, Attorney General, and he was especially uh, wily as far as this preemptive law and as Attorney General. I guess he'd be in a great place to take advantage of it. How exactly, when you say they preemptively uh, uh, sat on these properties, how did they go about that? Well, under the, uh, under the Preemption Act, uh, they stake them out and then they file a claim to them. Uh, George Kerry and uh, Ronald McDonald are the two uh, key characters in this. And George Kerry was the Attorney General, and he's the governor's legal advisor. And he's, in fact, he's the premier of the colony of uh, Vancouver Island. He's MLA for Victoria, as a matter of fact. And so he's, uh, he controls the New Aberdeen Land Syndicate out at uh, Bella Coola, who's staked this land, and he controls the Bending Arm Company, which, goes, which is a road that was go through the Chilcotin, uh, where they spread the disease to clear this right away. So, and George Carey is, uh, has all the characteristics of a sociopath, uh, and in fact, he's certified insane within three years, and he dies uh, four years later. So the first, uh, you know, and I get a laugh when I say this at some of my presentations, the first... Uh, Premier of the province of British Columbia is act, was actually uh, certified insane. <laughs> <laughs> Not the last, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, so so now Carrie and that. I mean, there, there's one damning piece of evidence, and this came out in a, a, a Rob Wypond at Focus did a, did an extensive interview uh, uh, with you and wrote a very uh, a long piece. I don't know, it must be eight thousand words or something, uh, talking about your book, and he talks about Carrie who makes a trip to um, New Westminster, the then seat of government in, British, uh, in the nascent British Columbia, to, to do this, this very thing, to get some land that he knew was going to be free of those pesky natives because one of his agents had already headed out to uh, Bella Coola, right? Right. This is the land at uh, Bella Coola. And what happens here is that they, uh, we know from the records that they start introducing it on uh, about June the 10th is when the expedition arrives there, and a pool who read the, led the expedition said, my party introduced smallpox to Bellagula. So there's no mystery about how, a, how the smallpox got to Bellagula. But what, uh, what I noticed in doing the research was that George Carey, uh, who controls the New Aberdeen Land Syndicate, which has the land underneath those villages staked, uh, he goes to New Westminster uh, on the same day, uh, on June the 10th, and he goes the same day to claim the land, to make sure that the land is registered for his clients. Uh, now that's critical because under the Preemption Act, you can't claim land if it's not vacant. Mm -hmm. So he knew ahead of time that it was going to become vacant starting on June the 10th. I, you know, and, and, and the shocking thing, well, shocking for me living in Victoria, you know, we walk, as I mentioned off the top, we walk around in these streets uh, around here and you see these names and, and uh, honestly, I, I'm ashamed to say I didn't really think much about them. I knew Begbie was the hanging judge and Douglas, you know, was the, was the first uh, governor general. But, you know, beyond that, you know, I, I don't think most people know anything. Helmican, as I mentioned, who, uh, whose name is on the street that now uh, is home to the general hospital, he wrote uh, in, in his old age, uh, he looked back, and, and I'll take a quote over here because it really made my heart uh, freeze when I read this. He says, and this is um, a doctor, Helmican, all men must die. Indians obeyed the mandate, perhaps a little earlier than they otherwise might. Socially, probably, their death is of little consequence. Politically, it may be of more importance, but they are Indians still. The breed remains and will require a great deal of crossing to make a superior race. And that's the, uh, uh, the good Dr. Helmican. This attitude, a friend of mine said, well, you know, this was sort of a sign of the times. Can we forgive these guys as saying, well, you know, people back then, they were just, you know, this was kind of normal for them, and the Indians were just savages, you know, less than dogs, really. You know, theft was wrong then, and theft is wrong now. Killing people was wrong then, killing people is wrong now. Um, of course we can hold them, uh, you know, hold them culpable, absolutely. 
I mean, it, they knew what they were doing was wrong. <laughs> There's no question about it. They knew that they were, you know, that they were going through this big land grab, uh, and that they helped they kill the Indians off on top of the land in order to get the land. <laughs> I mean, stealing property has been theft in every culture, everywhere, <laughs> at any time. It's uh, this is you know, this is not something you can say. Well, you know, they really didn't know. Well, well, you know. There is also an account, and it's cited again in uh, in Rob's article and in your book, uh, a report from the Victoria Daily, Daily Press, a, 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 a um, an opinion piece that calls that calls them explicitly to account. Even then, right right then, they're uh, talking about the attitudes towards the, their government towards the natives and what's happening with this really shocking um, uh, um, epidemic. Where I mean, if you think of the numbers, a hundred thousand people died, estimated. In just over a year, I mean that—that's an immense. Right, and uh, even here at Victoria, where the Indians were dying on the street and the bodies were being left out in the streets, um, and people were just shocked. I mean, it just uh, they just had no ken that this could happen. And people uh, writing in the newspapers, they talk about how people just couldn't imagine uh, with what force the uh, smallpox went through in Victoria, the native uh, community. Well, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to Grill Radio on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria and CFUV.uvic.ca on the internet everywhere else. I'm speaking tonight with Tom Swanky, and Tom is the author of this book that I have in my hot hand right now, The True Story of Canada's War of Extermination on the Pacific, plus the Chicolton and other First Nations resistance. You know, Tom, I, I did take history. I'm, I'm no scholar. I dropped out of school, but I did go back to Camosun College where I took Canadian history, both pre- and post-Confederation. When I uh, sat down the first day in pre-Confederation uh, Canadian history, our instructor said, now for those, this happens to me every year, says he, um, for those of you that want to learn about the Indians, we're not going to cover Indians in this course because Indians didn't build Canada. So don't even ask me questions about Indians. Uh, and this was a college professor saying that. Uh, and, and true to his word, he, we didn't discuss Indians at all. I've never heard of the Chicolton War and some of these other wars that you mentioned that went on. I mean, it, people, I guess, like to believe that the First Nations here just thought, oh, well, these white guys are better than us and we'll just move further and further away and happily go to reserves. Uh, but that's not exactly how it happened, is it? No, the uh, three wars that I cover in some detail in my book, the uh, Shimshin War, the uh, Cowichan War, and the Chicotan War, uh, these all happen as the natives uh, kill people off, uh, settlers who were spreading smallpox. Uh, in the Chilcotin, uh, for example, they uh, they kill uh, a number of settlers who were spreading the disease, and then they execute um, two or three people, uh, three of them, uh, who they convict under their own rules. And then at uh, the incident at Budinet, where they kill off settlers, several settlers to prevent uh, new epidemics of being spread. And uh, my book contains the, uh, a real uh, full account of the Chilcotin War, and I show that uh, the Chilcotin chiefs, which were hung at Quinell, um, that they were invited to a conference with the governor, actually, and when they went to the conference, they were ambushed, um, and they were thrown in chains, and they're taken to Quinell, and they're hung. Uh, they're put through the show trial, the, uh, I was saying that uh, this fellow, Ronald McDonald, is a key uh, factor in the uh, smallpox epidemics. Well, the defense counsel uh, who volunteered to defend the Chilcotin chiefs was his brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine why smallpox never came up at the trial, even though that's why they had killed all of the people that they were being accused of killing. And this is at a time when, as you document, there's agents are being sent, actively sent to explicitly exterminate uh, the natives, do they? Do we know? Did they intend to kill every single one of them? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the uh, I think that's uh, what they planned to do. And you can see where the uh, where the and in the book I document this at great length, uh, where the death toll is uh, concentrated. It's concentrated in the areas that they immediately want for settlement. Uh, it's very very targeted. Uh, this is a seeing eye disease. The disease doesn't go below the 49th parallel. It doesn't cross the continental divide, and it doesn't go into Alaska. You know, this disease has a constitutional law background for some reason. And then uh, in the province, it concentrates in the Caribou. It concentrates in the uh, in the uh, Fraser uh, Fraser uh, Canyon Highway, and the Caribou Wagon Road, and the Bending Arm Road, and the Stikine Gold Rush. I mean, those are the places where the where the disease was concentrated. The areas which they needed to seize uh, for the first areas of settlement. 
Well, wouldn't wouldn't that be expected though? Like, would the, anywhere the anywhere the white settlers go, or the prospectors go, or those that are, are 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 you know going out to survey roads for possible development, wouldn't it just follow logically that that's where the disease would follow? Yeah, but the miners don't take the disease. The miners don't have the disease. There's no disease up in Richfield. There's 9,000 miners up there, and there was no disease up there uh, the entire time. Uh, so the miners actually don't have the disease, and the miners aren't spreading the disease. It's the people who, it's the land speculators, it's the people who are interested in the infrastructure. Uh, those are the people who are uh, seeing that the disease is spread. So may, maybe they would be, in today's terms, the pipeline prospectors. <laughs> well, they would be uh, not so much the pipeline prospectors, but they would be the people who were expecting to benefit from the pipeline. Uh, the land speculators, uh, the people there who are buying up the land underneath so that when the pipeline comes, they'll be able to flip it to the pipeline. Those are the people that uh, were the real, it's the speculators who are in between the, in the project. Oh, things change, but they do remain the same. Well, Tom, we're fast running out of time, but I can't go before mentioning uh, you're you're going to appear at the well. Wait a second, the Anarch the Anarchist Book Fair, which I mentioned at the top, but you do mention, and I off air you told me that you don't want to talk about the location of this. There's a mass grave over in Vic West from this um, outbreak, and nobody knows about it except for you and maybe a few others and, and some First Nations, I guess. And it's not marked and it's not advertised. You said you didn't want to advertise it. Why not? Well, because there's a, there's a long history of these grave sites being pillaged and uh, and taken apart and disassembled and people dig into them. And uh, many, uh, as I was doing this research, uh, many uh, First Nations people asked me not to disclose uh, specific right. graveyards and grave sites, even though I know where there's quite a number now. I mean, quite a number have been disclosed to me. But it's still, it's, uh, there is contention about numbers and so forth of dead and, you know, maybe with radar or, you know, ground penetrating radar or something like that, we could get an idea or exhume and give proper burials to, at least for the First Nations. I mean, isn't that a possibility too? Well, those are all possibilities, but that's up to the First Nations people. When they think they can be in control of it, uh, then they will take control of it and they will handle it. I'm not um, going to get it out of you, am I? <laughs> <laughs> but then with all these condos going up right, left and center, and especially out onto the Songhees lands now, I mean, isn't there a danger that that land, if it's we don't know what's under it, then, you know, something will get dropped on top of it? Oh, I think that's absolutely probable. I don't think there's any, uh, there's, any there's going to be any doubt about that. Well, Tom, it's a fascinating book. Now, you're going to be talking at uh, the, uh, uh, as I said, the Anarchist Book Fair, the seventh annual Anarchist Book Fair, starting a Saturday, September 8th. And tell us a little bit uh, about your presentation that you plan. What I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try to cover three things um, in my presentation there, which starts at 4 o'clock, I think, on the Saturday. I'm going to do smallpox at Victoria and do a complete uh, run-through of how the disease spreads, um, all kinds of things that we didn't get a chance to talk about here today. I'm going to do the uh, biological weapons attack at Bellacoola, and then I'm going to do the Chocolate War if we have time for it. Well, well, Tom, it's immensely important work, and and it's being sadly neglected for a long time. And I hope that others will pick up the uh, pick up your lead. And your son Sean, now he's in the uh, the fundraising stage uh, of making a documentary film about these topics as well, right? Yes, we're in the fundraising scriptwriting stage where we're costing out what the project will cost. Well, okay. So, uh, and what's your what's your son's uh, website? So it's uh, www.seanswanky.com, where we have lots of articles on the smallpox um, and in about the process of how it's done and uh, what the effects are of it uh, today. That's Sean S H A W N Swanky dot com. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a good site. Go there and find out more. And uh, if you want to invest, I can't think of a worthier film project to do that. And uh, the Canadians can't uh, let ignorance be their excuse to to not have a reconciliation about uh, the terrible history, and especially out here on the West Coast. And as you described. It's just shocking. Thanks a lot, uh, Tom Swanky, for coming on tonight. Thanks for having me, Chris.